Hi everyone! When it comes to aggregate demand and aggregate supply, there are two different major schools of thought on this topic. You have the classical uh, school of thought, which has a very unique interpretation of what aggregate supply looks like, and you have the Keynesian school of thought, which has its own interpretation of aggregate supply. Both schools agree on aggregate demand, but because of this vast difference uh, between aggregate supply, you have different ideas as to how the macroeconomy needs to be managed. Let's here look at the classical model. Start with some assumptions first. In the classical model, there is a big difference, an important difference, between the short run and the long run. And that is taken into different interpretations of aggregate supply as well. So we have a short run aggregate supply curve, uh, whose position is determined by costs of production in the economy. So if costs of production rise, maybe that's because of an increase in wages, Maybe that's because of an increase in the price of raw materials or commodities. All the factors that I've talked about on my previous video on the causes of inflation. Uh, then SRES will shift to the left. And the SRES curve is very simply upward sloping. And we call it SRES. So the classicals uh, believe in this short run aggregate supply curve. But also a long run aggregate supply curve. Uh, whose position is determined by the quantity and quality of factors of production. It's vertical because it represents the level of full employment in the economy. The maximum output that can be produced by using all factors of production to their maximum potential sustainably. So that is vertical because it represents one value of output, the full employment level of output. However, if the quantity and quality of factors of production increase, then the curve can shift outwards. Okay, so that's the long run aggregate supply curve. Uh, and therefore, there are two different equilibriums. We can have equilibrium where AD equals SRAS. That's the short-run equilibrium. And we can have a long-run equilibrium where AD equals LRAS. That's important. Both schools of thought do not differ on AD. It's just C plus I plus G plus X minus M, downward sloping as we've learned it. No problems there. The difference comes in the aggregate supply curve. So short-run equilibrium and long-run equilibrium. Straight away, Keynes would disagree with all of that. No difference in aggregate supply, no difference between short and long run. He would argue that's a load of tosh, a load of rubbish basically. But fundamental assumptions in the classical model. How the classical economists define the short run and the long run? Well, the short run is where wages are fixed. More generally, it's where resource prices are fixed, but to understand our model, where wages are fixed. Remember that. And the long run is where wages are, are variable. Importantly, there are no time frames put on the short run and the long run. Uh, we don't know when the long run will happen. All we know is that when wages become variable and when workers accept higher or lower wages, that's when we hit the long run in this model. No time frame on that. And the final thing here, this is the conclusion of the model, basically. In the long run, classical economists believe that an economy will always move back to or be at the full employment level of output. There is no need for government intervention there is no need for excessive management in the economy. The economy will self-heal and return back to full employment on its own. Let's have a look how that happens. We'll take two examples of an economy. An economy in recession and an economy that's overheating in a boom. And we'll see how in the classical model, the economy will self-heal and return to full employment. Let's take an economy here with a short run equilibrium, where AD cuts SRS which happens to be at the full employment level of output. So I can draw LRAS going through this equilibrium because we're making the assumption that that is the full employment level of output with a price level of P1. Let's say for some reason aggregate demand shifts to the left from AD1 to AD2. That could be because of a sudden fall in investment, let's say. Any component of AD may have suddenly fallen, taking the economy into recession. Now, the new short-term equilibrium would be here, where AD cuts SRAS, the new SRAS curve, and that will lead to a reduction in output at a lower price level. But before that happens, firms have got to think to themselves. Initially, they were producing at full employment, at YFE, all firms in the economy were getting together, producing a maximum level of output. But now with a recession basically taking place, with lower levels of demand in the economy, firms have got to make a decision. They can accept this lower level of output and produce less, but that will mean sacking workers. That will mean reducing the size of their workforce, which maybe they don't really want to do. 
So therefore, if they want to continue producing at their full employment levels, at maximum production levels, well, the only way to do that is to reduce their costs somehow. Demand is lower in the economy at AD2. If they want to get back to YFE, the only thing in their control is to reduce costs and to shift SRAS back here to the right to cut AD at this point, which takes us back to the YFE level of output. And why would they want to maybe continue producing there? Well, they don't want to reduce the size of their workforce, maybe, because the workers have got a skill. They're trained. A lot of money has been spent on actually getting them to a decent level of training, getting them to a productive uh, part of the uh, production process, in which case getting rid of them is a bit of a waste. So firms would rather keep workers and sack them if that's the case. So they would like to continue operating a YFE. So what is in their control to shift SRAS to the right? What cost of production can they lower which can take them there? Well, wages. Wages is a major cost for firms, and that's something that employers have control over. So if they want to reduce their costs, well, they, they can cut wages. And by cutting wages, SRAS can shift to the right, taking the economy back to YFE. But that's not a viable option in the short run in the classical model. Why? Because wages are fixed in the short run for three main reasons. One, it could be that minimum wages are high in the economy, which prevents, by law, wages falling below them. It could be that uh, unemployment benefits are quite high and generous in the economy, whereby cutting wages might not make sense. The incentive might then not be to continue working, it might be just to uh, accept unemployment and take unemployment benefits. But I think probably the, the biggest reason, especially in advanced nations, is the strength of trade unions. With strong trade unions, it becomes very difficult to cut wages. Trade unions fight against that. In fact, they fight for higher wages. They will never really accept lower wages which makes it very difficult for firms to cut wages, even in times of uh, very low demand and recession. So for that reason, wages tend to be fixed in the short run, and firms have got to accept this new equilibrium of lower output uh, and therefore higher unemployment. This is known as a deflationary gap, or a recessionary gap. So in the classical model, this is a recession taking place right here, and with it, lower levels of inflation, which is why it's known as a deflationary gap. Who knows, that could well be deflation, in the inflation rate going negative. And what are the characteristics here? Well, we, we see lower output, and we see higher unemployment levels. Characteristics of a recessionary gap or a deflationary gap. But key thing is, in the classical model, this will not be sustained in the long run. In the long run, wages become variable. There is no time frame put on that, but eventually wages become variable. Why? Because with persistent unemployment, workers revise down their wage expectations. They maybe realise that the reason they're not getting work is because their wage expectations are too high. And maybe that's stopping them actually get a job, getting a job. So eventually, workers start to revise down their wage expectations. They accept lower wages, which for firms reduces their cost of production and shifts SRAS to the right to SRAS 2. And that takes the economy back to the full employment level of output, but now at an even lower price level of P3. And that's the key adjustment that takes place naturally in the economy. Wages become variable, wages start to fall, reducing costs of production, taking uh, the economy back to YFE. And wages become variable very simply because workers start to realise that maybe the, the higher wages are the reason why they're stuck in in uh, unemployment here. The only way to solve that is to revise down wage expectations. So, uh, in this model here, uh, whenever there is a recession, it's okay because in the long term the economy will self heal. What we do see are side effects lower demand pull inflation from P1 to P2 initially, and also lower cost push inflation from P2 to P3. So, the economy will self heal back to YFE, but just with lower levels of inflation in the economy. What about if the economy is overheating? How does the classical model explain adjustments in the economy as a result of that taking place? Well, let's again redraw our axis where we'll show the price level and real GDP. Let's again take an economy with a short run equilibrium which happens to be at full employment. So the economy here is settled at a full employment level of output, or YFE, 
with a price level P1. So the economy right now is in long-term equilibrium. Let's now say for some reason aggregate demand shifts to the right this time from AD1 to AD2. Right, we know the short-term equilibrium is going to be here at Y2 with a higher price level, higher demand for infl inflation at P2. Now firms like this equilibrium a lot. They like it because wages are still fixed in the short run. Bear this in mind as I go through the explanation here. So this new short-term equilibrium implies that output can increase beyond the full employment level of output. Now that seems ridiculous. How could that happen? Well remember, at full employment, the unemployment rate is not 0%. There is still some unemployment out there. The frictionally unemployed, the structurally unemployed, the uh, seasonally unemployed. So that uh, unemployment rate can be in, an, in advanced economies around 5%. So therefore, it is possible in the short run to employ some of those people and to produce more than the full employment level of output. Maybe it's not employing fresh people that takes us to Y2. Maybe it's just existing workers working harder, working overtime. Because remember again, the YFE level of output represents maximum use of factors of production at sustainable levels. Well, maybe in the short term we can use our factors of production unsustainably. Maybe that's using workers to work instead of 9 hour days, work 12 hour days. Unsustainable, you're going to weigh your workers out. But in the short term, it's possible to do that. But the key thing is, firms can produce at Y2, paying workers, whether it's existing workers or whether it's new workers, they can pay them the same wage rate. And why is that? Wages are fixed in the short run because workers are slow to adapt. They're slow to realise that either they're in scarce supply, therefore they can drive up their wages. They're slow to realise that, oh, they're working so much more, they're working so much harder but at the same wage rate, and therefore, hang on, they can actually bargain for higher wages if they did, if they wanted to. And they're slow to realise that with inflation in the economy, their bargaining power actually increases. They can ask for higher wages, and most likely it will be given to them. So in the short run, they're slow to adapt, which means the economy settles in the short run at this equilibrium, producing more than YFE. But classical economists argue, no. If you shift AD to the right uh, in a period of uh, initially full employment, all that's going to happen is you see inflation. This equilibrium here of higher growth is not going to be sustained. Eventually, workers will change their wage expectations. Wages become variable in the long run, and workers realise that, oh, I can demand higher wages for the reasons I've said before. And as soon as all workers start to do that and demand higher wages, that increases costs of production for firms, shifting SRES to the left from SRES1 to SRES2, taking the economy back to YFE, but now with just a higher rate of inflation. So initially, we had demand pull inflation from P1 to P2, and then we saw cost push inflation as wages increased. And this gap here, is known as an inflationary gap for that reason. And characteristics of an inflationary gap? Well, you tend to see higher output beyond, so greater than uh, the full employment level of output, and you tend to see lower unemployment, lower than the natural rate of unemployment, characteristics there, but not sustained, not sustained, or not sustainable in the long run as wages become variable there. Um, all you see is that inflation increases, which is why classical economists are known as supply-side economists. They say that if the economy is at full employment, which it will always be in the long run, the only way to reduce the natural rate of unemployment, to grow sustainably, is through use of supply-side policies, to shift long-run aggregate supply to the right. Demand-side management, expansionary demand-side policies are not going to be useful at all. All you're going to see is an increase in inflation and no increase in full employment levels of output. All right, so that's the classical model of aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Let's now compare that to the Keynesian model in my next video. See you then, thanks for watching.